Uh, we uh, have a great pleasure to have today uh, Bhuvnesh Jain, uh, who is going to talk us about Galaxy 7, the possible breakdown of the standard model of cosmology. A few words about, uh, about Bhuv. Uh, Bhuv has been working since the early 90s on the large-scale structure of the universe, uh, and uh, in particular galaxy surveys and, and weak lensing. His uh, result has uh, had a lot of impact on the uh, on the community and it's been an inspiration for many people, including me, uh, and I uh, urge you to read these papers. Um, he's been working on many different topics, uh, including even uh, solar system studies uh, in, in recent times. He's uh, deeply involved in, uh, in DES, LSST, and also Euclid. Uh, so it's, uh, I, mean, I think we'll have a, an excellent talk today, and I'm really happy to, to have him uh, uh, speak in front of us. Uh, one last point, we'll have a, a lunch with, uh, with Booth after the, the talk, of course, and uh, if you want to, to join us, don't hesitate to, to ask. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Karim. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk to you about current tensions in cosmology. And a, slight, and a somewhat unconventional proposal that uh, we presented in two papers this summer to resolve the H0 tension in particular. Um, that part of the work relies on these pulsating giant stars called Cepheids. So uh, I'll get to that a little ways into the talk, but I thought I'd um, leave you this visual. This is a, a, a simulation of a pulsating star. So these turn out to be quite critical for modern cosmology. Uh, I'll also uh, present results on lensing in sigma eight that are with the dark energy survey collaboration. And the Cepheid uh, H0 work is with Harry Desmond, who is a postdoc at Oxford, and Jeremy Sachstein at Penn. So these are the four parts. I'll give you an update on the current status of cosmology, which may be familiar to many of you, but it's good to touch base, uh, and describes qualitatively the types of alternatives to dark energy or lambda CDM that have been proposed to resolve this tension. And then I'll present our new proposal and look ahead to the next decade. So very brief bottom line. It appears the universe today is expanding faster and mass fluctuations are smaller than you'd expect if you started with the CMB and evolved the universe in the standard model. And the standard model I will call is general relativity plus lambda vacuum energy plus cold dark matter. So, many of us are motivated to look at departures from this model. So this is the evidence that you may have seen. Uh, this is H0, the expansion rate of the universe, omega matter, the mass density. This is the measurement of H0 today. Um, this is as of a year and a bit ago by Reese et al, one sigma, two sigma. And the blue is, a, you know, one of the the best estimates of H0 based primarily on the CMB. So this tension uh, was 4.4 sigma last year. Um, this is the local value, H0 is higher, and this is the CMB inferred value, H0 is lower. So if you take measurements at redshift 1100 from the CMB and propagate them <laughs> forward, you would expect today's expansion rate to be 67. In fact, it's 74. And this discrepancy is 4.4 sigma as of last year's Planck paper. So this is one of the centers of the Planck experiment. So I assume you're quite familiar with the Planck results <clears throat> and also with this tension. But the update as of a couple of months ago um, from a, uh, a recent conference is this. So these are the early universe uh, estimates of H0, again 67. This is the Planck result, and this is 
quite interestingly, a completely alternate route to H0 that's based on the early universe plus BAO and the, and the Dark Energy Survey Galaxy and lensing measurements. So they're entirely consistent. And the point is that these begin with an estimate of conditions in the early universe. There's a number of measurements shown here in the late universe. So this is the reset all result updated uh, from a paper this year. Um, and this is a tip of the red giant branch result. This is um, you know, using other variable stars. This is an important result based on strong lensing. So the green result is supposedly an alternate way to get at this distance than uh, using dist the distance ladder. Uh, but with the possible exception of this, re this result, you can see they all come out significantly higher. Um, and, you know, although I'm going to stick to four point some sigma, uh, you should know that there are claims that this tension is almost at six sigma. So these are not all independent, but at least this and this are independent, and this is partially independent. So when we are comparing the early universe and the late universe, when I say early universe, I don't mean 10 to the minus 32 seconds. I mean uh, from a few minutes to, uh, to 400,000 years when the CMB last scattered. So this is the present day universe's energy budget, baryons, atoms, dark matter, dark energy. This is quite old, but for the point we want to make, these numbers are close enough. So we are dark energy dominated, and then next is dark matter. When the universe was uh, 400,000 years old, the story was very different. You can see the color scheme has changed. Dark energy is almost is negligible. Dark matter dominates, but an important showing is made by photons and neutrinos. And that's going to be important, because if we want to change the story from the early universe side, uh, you know, relativistic species, neutrino interactions, dark matter decay into these kind of things can all play a role. So please keep that in mind. Uh, just to touch base with something we are all familiar with, these are the beautiful power spectrum measurements from Planck, TT, TE, -E -E, and also the lensing. Uh, and of course, um, you know, this lambda CDM best fit is ridiculously good. You can fit to this and fit the others um, perfectly well. So this is, of course, the basis for the language of a standard model of cosmology, that general relativity and lambda CDM <coughs> succeeds remarkably well in many individual data sets. But we're interested in comparing that early universe to the present day or late universe. So we're going to talk about weak lensing, galaxy surveys, large-scale structure. We won't talk about galaxy clusters, although they're also an important probe. And supernovae and strong lensing. So these are purely geometric. They rely on the distance redshift relation, and they get us H0. These are uh, you know, more complicated measurements that are sensitive to both geometry and growth. So when we talk about sigma 8, the amplitude of mass fluctuations, We'll be talking about these um, probes from galaxy surveys. OK, sorry for the way this text is appearing. So how do we get H? How do we, I mean, I'm having to use my yoga skills to really. Uh, how do we get H naught from the CMB? Uh, the CMB measures angles, you know, all those wiggles in angular wave number help us measure some special angles. And each angle can be interpreted as a physical distance in megaparsecs divided by the angular diameter distance to that redshift. So z star is the redshift of recombination. So this distance, in particular the sound horizon at last scattering, is independent of h naught. It depends on the physical densities of baryons, photons, CDM, neutrinos, between um, you know, t equals 0 and last scattering. This distance is the distance from us to the CMB, 
This depends on the evolution of the, the expansion rate all the way from redshift zero to redshift 1100. And so this is where we, H naught comes in and the standard cosmological model. So we measure this, we calculate this, and then we can infer H naught, assuming a cosmological model. So that lets you see the ways in which <clears throat> things could um, break. So if we want to change the value of H naught inferred from the CMB, then we have to still keep these measured angles fixed, consistent with the data. And it's not just the sound horizon, but there's two other scales, the silk damping scale and the scale of matter radiation equality that is imprinted in the CMB power spectra. So the way early universe solutions work, by early universe solutions I mean breaking lambda CDM from t equals zero to last scattering, is they change the sound horizon by about 10 percent. And they have to do it in order to fix H naught as inferred from the sound horizon, but then they also have to, have to worry about these two other scales. So that's what constrains the freedom in messing with the early universe, that there's you know, mul multiple pieces of information in the CMB, and you can't break others in trying to fix one. So a very rough summary of the kinds of new physics that could resolve this tension. Uh, dark energy properties, you know, if you just free W0 and WA, you can get some formal fit in the late universe where dark energy dominates. But that doesn't work out. So most of the theoretical effort lately has been on modifications in the early universe. So all these statements I make that that doesn't work out or that's good or that's bad, they're you know, very rough subjective opinions reflecting partly the community view lately and my own view. Uh, the early dark energy uh, resolutions ha are in the nature of there's a third period of dark energy, dom you know, a presence of dark energy. So there was inflation, there's the accelerating universe now, and so theorists are inventing a period where, where dark energy made a showing just before recombination, and it changed the expansion of the universe then. So needless to say, this is contrived, fine-tuned, blah, blah. You know, this is not elegant, minimalist physics. Um, or new species or interactions in the early universe, dark matter decay, neutrino sector interactions. Of course, gravity doesn't have to be GR, so there's a long, um, you know, literature on modified gravity. Again, in the late universe, it's very hard to do. Uh, people have looked at the early universe, no, also not very successful. But a rough consensus in the, among the theoretical community is that it's l more likely to be new physics before recombination because at low redshift, you measure the expansion rate pretty much today. And that disagrees with the CMB. But the expansion rate is also measured out to r r uh, you know, redshift zero to one point something quite well. And lambda CDM does great there. So if you want to change the expansion rate today without changing it out to Z of one, that's very contrived, very difficult to do. Of course, the model I'm going to show you evades this argument, but this is the, the community view lately. So just to fill you in a little more on the kinds of models people are studying, uh, the number of um, dark radiation, the number of relativistic species uh, prior to loss scattering, if you increase that, you can resolve the H, the H naught tension partly, two sigma, maybe, but you do other things. So this is a flavor for what happens when you try to mess with the early universe. This is H naught, number of relativistic species. This is the canonical value. If you try to go bigger than that, you resolve the H naught tension but the color scheme shows you that you worsen another tension. So this is sigma eight, which we'll talk about later, 
but what the red point and yellow shows is that you make sigma 8 higher and, and, the, and the sigma 8 measured in the low redshift universe is already lower than the CMB. So you make the sigma 8 tension worse. So this solution is uh, probably not successful. Then there's different models of the late universe. As I mentioned, they're not successful. <coughs> the, this slide is from a, is from a, a postdoc at Pantan V. Carval, who works on, on this topic. She's um, uh, uh, you know, a co-author on this paper. So their view is that potential solutions include a very recent paper on strongly interacting neutrino sector or a very localized dark energy modification. As I mentioned, if you only inject this dark energy between redshift 10,000 and 1,000, then uh, you can do the job, but still at about the two sigma level. So none of these naturally gets you a four or five sigma alleviation. So just to pick a few models and look at the considerations, uh, number of relativistic species, this dark energy interacting in neutrinos, do they solve H naught? You know, uh, uh, Francis Young's view is they don't. Uh, yes, maybe. Do they make sigma eight worse, 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 better? Uh, and then, you know, other theoretical considerations and how to actually build a model. So these are still early days. There is uh, no very appealing model yet, uh, and it's going to be a lot of work. This uh, was from, uh, you know, Reset et al., I guess 2018 maybe, uh, where they showed <clears throat> that if you have the early and late universe, and these are these various inelegant attempts to resolve them, they typically get you halfway. Okay, so that was my, you know, very uncomprehensive summary of attempts to uh, alleviate the H0 tension. But in a paper uh, a year and a bit ago, Marco Raveri and Wayne Hu looked at various other tensions. And there's an interesting literature on this topic of tensions between data sets and between data sets and models. And I just want to point out three things. This is the CMB H0 tension. So I'm not going to go into the statistics they use, but this is two sigma and, you know, something like three-ish, four sigma. So the H0 tension has gotten worse since they wrote this paper. This is the A lens tension, that is the lensing of the CMB. Uh, does the you know, expectation doesn't quite match what the Planck CLs show. And this is the sigma A tension, that the amplitude of fluctuations as inferred from the CMB is higher than what we measure from lensing and galaxy surveys. So these are the three tensions, at least three tensions, that are quite interesting and definitely should be watched closely because the data is, you know, <clears throat> growing rapidly. So, you know, um, I mean, I, you know, I definitely am talking about cosmology. I didn't mean any political joke or anything here. Uh, the question is, you know, what do you personally feel about three sigma or four sigma, or do you worry about the, si the estimation of the error bars? There are claims that, you know, I mostly uh, stick to the Reese et al. Uh, result on the present day H naught. I think that's definitely the most mature, the most scrutinized result, and the new work that's coming in with TRGBs and strong lensing is very important, but it's much more recent. They all have issues, uh, but you know, <clears throat> physics type cosmologists have always complained about astronomers and their small data sets and their method methodology, but of course the accelerating universe was discovered by exactly that kind of flawed astronomy data set and analysis. So um, I certainly take it very seriously. Um, <clears throat> but um, but more scrutiny is needed. The reset all result does rely on a small sample analyzed by one team using, you know, they don't use blinded methodology or, or, or other modern techniques that, uh, that many of us try to use. 
So it's been scrutinized. It's very careful work. It's you know a great advance. But um, but we still have to think about uh, about this question, and many people have you know different takes on it. So. <laughs> We are, we are very interested in this other kind of impeachment hearing also, which is progressing at a much more rapid pace these days than the cosmological issue. Um, so let's look at the other tension, <clears throat> the amplitude uh, of fluctuations. I like this plot because I like the color scheme, but it's old. Uh, uh, it's from Hu and Hyman's paper and Cora Dvorkin. Um, um, but it's interesting to see that this tension has also been around. So this, this plot shows H naught and sigma eight, and, um, and this is CMB, and this is the low Z universe. Um, and so the sigma eight values, interestingly, have shifted down from both of these surveys. And you can think about you know, why there are more than one sigma shifts, at least from the um, from the low redshift universe. And even the observables that are emphasized have shifted, but this is still a two sigma tension. Uh, and this is, of course, a much higher tension. <clears throat> so that brings me to a weak lensing and galaxy surveys, considering um, the amplitude of fluctuations. So this is a mass map from the dark energy surveys year one analysis where we had about 30 million galaxies over 1,200 square degrees. Um, we are working on the year three analysis, uh, which is uh, you know, well underway. We had hoped to, Elizabeth and I were just talking, we had hoped to have results out about now, uh, but we still believe we are you know, a few months away. Um, so this is uh, on you know, more than 4,500 square degrees, so more than 10% of the sky and 120 or so million galaxies we expect. So it's a factor of four increase in data size, so our error bar should go down by a factor of two on sigma eight type parameters. And the full survey, the, years, the year, six year survey is completed, uh, but still our, we'll begin analysis after we put out this result, so in hopefully early 2020. We have two great uh, peers, of the KIDS survey and the Subaru HSC survey are also ongoing. So in the results that I'll show, we have you know, galaxies from redshift zero to you know, 1.5 or so, uh, and more realistically 1.2 or 1.3 is where we have our, our father's source bin. So we analyze all three two-point correlations of these galaxy and shear fields galaxy clustering, galaxy shear cross-correlation, and shear-shear correlations in five lens redshift bins and four source redshift bins. We also analyze the six two-point correlations when you fold in the kappa field from the CMB, from the SPT survey, uh, but I won't show results with that. So far, the gains with adding the CMB have been modest in statistical error, although very valuable in checking systematics. <clears throat> so I don't want to spend many slides on this, so I've just cut to the bottom line. This is a plot from Elizabeth, who's one of the architects of DES cosmology analysis, showing the results in sigma eight, S eight rather, uh, versus omega matter. So S eight is a combination of sigma eight and omega matter. Uh, that's very well measured by lensing. Um, and this is DES, this is Planck, uh, you know, 68, 95% confidence intervals. And you can see there's a less than two sigma tension. So at that time, we had considered the data sets consistent. Uh, this is the shear shear correlation only, which is something that has been um, measured and analyzed by DES and also by the Subaru HSC and KID surveys, and the CFH lens survey, which is older. Uh, so you can see this is Planck. So it ranges from one to two sigma for individual data sets. If you combine the data sets, which has not been done in a methodical way, 
uh, but uh, you can be pretty confident that the tension is higher than two sigma. So of course two sigma is not devastating and we are not agonizing too much about uh, you know, how seriously to take its statistical significance because the error bars are going to shrink quite steadily for the next couple of years. There are at least two other methods of getting sigma-8, galaxy clusters, which I won't talk about, and redshift space distortions. So this is a paper that came out very recently by Troster et al. Uh, that combines kids' weak lensing with the BOSS redshift space uh, power spectrum. And again, I don't want to spend too long over it, but if you look at, say, sigma-8 here, um, then you see uh, just over two sigma tension. So this is CMB, and this is, this is Planck, and the green contour is the combination of lensing and galaxy clustering. Most of the galaxy cluster abundance results also come in at low sigma, with low sigma 8. So again, people worry about um, you know, the robustness of, the, uh, of these different probes, but it is very hard to ignore the fact that all of the most careful low redshift clustering analyses show a lower sigma 8. Something that has only begun to be done is to look at these theoretical proposals that break lambda CDM and see how they impact both sigma 8, S8 here, and H0. So this plot shows the weak lensing sigma 8, which is here, uh, and the low redshift H0, which is here, and shows how these different modifications uh, change the Planck sigma 8 and H0 from lambda CDM to this direction. So these models, dark radiation, early dark energy, are designed to help with H0, which they do to some extent, and they generically worsen sigma 8. Among the proposals that I'm aware of, this uh, strongly interacting neutrinos, which I've not read the paper, so I don't know much about it, uh, is the one that appears to help with both. But this is obviously a very important exercise for theorists to carry out. So that's the status update on cosmology and a little glimpse of DES results, uh, which is what I mostly work on. So, you know, I don't know very much about H0, but I did work with um, Harry Desmond and Jeremy Sackstein on this uh, fun project that I'll tell you about. So, how do Reese et al. and other groups infer H0? There's 20 supernovae in the nearby universe that are calibrated using Cepheids. So these are tw 20 galaxies, each of which had a supernova, and the red dots show Cepheids. So I'll tell you a little bit about what Cepheids are, but they're these pulsating stars, and there can be many of them in a single galaxy, so you estimate a distance to each and then average. So, you know, you also have to calibrate the Cepheid distance, but let's not uh, get into those details. Let's say you have a distance to each Cepheid, you average it, you get a distance to the galaxy, and you use that to calibrate the supernova. Because supernova are standard candles, except that we don't know exactly what that absolute luminosity is, so they have to be calibrated. So Cepheids are an indispensable step in the distance ladder. In the last two decades, the distance ladder has been simplified, which makes it much more reliable, but it still has one step before you get to supernovae. So we exploit or consider that step carefully in, <coughs> in, in exploring a resolution to H0. So what are Cepheid variables? They are giant stars that are 3 to 15 times the mass of the sun that pulsate over days to weeks, which is a very convenient time period for human beings. They also have a very well understood relationship between the time period of their pulsation and their luminosity. That means that you can measure the time period, infer the luminosity, 
compare it to the measured flux and get a distance. Okay? So if you think about what drives the oscillations of the Cepheids, it's the outer parts of this envelope. So it's really just a ball of gas oscillating under gravity. So like all self-gravitating systems, its time period goes like 1 over root g rho, where rho is the density of the gas. So the proposal that we look at is that g is not g Newton in some of these galaxies, uh, in, in particular in some of these Cepheid envelopes. That there's a scalar field that enhances g, which lowers the time period, which leads to an underestimate of the distance, and an overestimate of the H naught. So that's the one sentence summary of our proposal. <clears throat> so the Cepheids themselves are calibrated using samples in the Milky Way. If those feel irregular gravity, G Newton, whereas some of the Cepheids in these galaxies feel this enhanced G because they feel a scalar field, then H naught is overestimated. The true H naught is lower than the reset all result. The CMB is right, like many of you have always known, and everybody's happy. And what we've done is we've introduced a scalar field that is <coughs> um, breaking lambda CDM. But we are not, what we are not doing is changing late time cosmological expansion. We are just changing the calibration of the distance ladder through fundamental physics, namely scalar tensor gravity or some other type of scalar field manifestation. So to show you why you should believe analyses and physics based on Cepheids, this is a cartoon of a pulsating Cepheid. These are the measured magnitudes versus time period or phase in three bands. This is the velocity of the envelope, and this is the size. A single numerical model with one or two free parameters related to opacity fits all of this data. So Cepheids are very, very well understood pulsating stars. This is the <clears throat> relation between period and, luminos uh, period and luminosity in five, six different bands. And so there's this tight relationship whose scatter goes down as you go into the infrared. So both empirically, the period luminosity relation and uh, detailed studies of some individual Cepheids uh, tell us that, um, that these are well-studied objects. To give you a vi uh, you know, visual feeling for the data, this is HST observations of a single Cepheid in Andromeda taken a few weeks apart. So these things are bright. Of course, in Andromeda, you can see them that easily. Um, <clears throat> but you can go out to 20 megaparsecs. So they are those distance calibrators that you can go out farthest with. In fact, that Cepheid <clears throat> has a long history. Almost a century ago, Hubble found that Cepheid in Andromeda and won the debate about whether those fuzzy things in the sky are blobs of gas in the Milky Way or external galaxies. So the so Cepheids, because he could, the, the period luminosity relationship, thanks to Henry Levitt and others, was known at that time. So the discovery of a single star in Andromeda settled the debate. So jumping ahead, uh, almost exactly 100 years, um, we had done a calculation of Cepheids in modified gravity. Okay, so if you haven't seen uh, an HR diagram in the recent past, this is luminosity, temperature, and the, the main sequence lives here, but we are talking about a giant star that's pulsating, so after it's, it's uh, done uh, with core burning, it has this track, the black line, um, and then when it crosses this magical strip, there's the physics of ionized helium in the envelope that makes it unstable to, pul to pulsations. So small perturbations make these things pulsate by like order, you know, order unity pulsations. 
So that's what produces a Cepheid. And we took this uh, beautiful code called MESA for stellar evolution. And Jeremy Sachstein put in a particular uh, gravity theory, F of R gravity, and obtained for two different models these, these new evolutionary tracks. So we can do full-blown calculations of Cepheid pulsations with these simple <coughs> scalar tensor theories. So how do the theories work? We're going to stop either when my time is up or when I run out of water from this espresso cup because I won't be able to speak. Um, so this is this topic called screened fifth forces. So scalar, a scalar field acts just like gravity in that it produces an, uh, an attractive force. And they are quite common. Dynamical models of dark energy and modified gravity invoke these new degrees of freedom. String theory has a bunch of them. If you produce a higher dimensional theory, <clears throat> like brain oscillations in a higher dimension act like scalar fields. So they capture a lot of you know, either extensions or expected extensions of Einstein's gravity. Whether they work for cosmology is you know, a more complicated question. But we generally expect scalar fields. You know, we've discovered the Higgs, so now we know there's one. But uh, certainly, string theorists expect others. Uh, so in principle, such scalar fields can have observable effects on all scales, uh, you know, if they're light. So this would be a problem, because general relativity is tested very well in the solar system. So they have to be screened. And a lot of the theoretical progress, oh, thank you. I, that was just a joke. <clears throat> a lot of the theoretical progress involves having a natural mechanism so that in very dense regions like where we live, the scalar field is suppressed. And in smaller galaxies or galaxies living in voids, the scalar field is active. There isn't an appealing theoretical model that does this. The optical counterpart to the gravity wave event uh, put a damper on some of these modified gravity theories. But of course, theorists are still working. So we don't consider the status of the field, which involves writing down Lagrangians uh, that look like this. Uh, but we just say that, let's say there is a theoretical proposal that uh, provides us with a scalar field. What will it do? So the first thing to note, you know, this is just kind of a general observation. A Cepheid is a big, puffy blob of gas that's more than 10 times bigger than, the, than the main, its main sequence counterpart. A supernova is a super compact object. So they have very different self-gravities. Of course, we know, we know exactly how they work in general relativity. But if you drop the assumption of general relativity, you might expect these objects to show different responses. It's also true that the 20 galaxies where the supernovae live, and in particular where the Cepheids live within the galaxy, have different gravitational environments. So what our proposal requires is that some fraction of these Cepheids have different gravity behavior than Cepheids in our Milky Way. And this requires one fine tuning, namely that the galaxies are just small enough or just under dense enough to turn on the scalar field. And there's a second parameter that has to do with the strength of the modification. Is it a 5% enhancement of gravity or 10% enhancement of gravity for these giant stars? For this, we have some guidance from theory. And also, we can do consistency tests from the data. So the bottom line is that we allow for about 5% enhancements of gravity. I won't tell you a lot more about the details of our work. You can look at our two papers. Uh, but this is one of the sorts of things that we estimate the dark matter density where these Cepheids live and compare it to the local density in the Milky Way. Uh, and you can see that there's a broad distribution. You know, It spans a few orders of magnitude. And so the hypothesis is that Cepheids that live in underdense regions are unscreened. So here's the bottom line. 
just as I showed you earlier plots on shifts in H naught. So <clears throat> this is, uh, you know, for one scalar field model using many different observational proxies of screening, this is showing how you could go from the local H naught would um, the, the local H naught would shift from being this green line to one of these points, depending on the details of the model. Okay? And this is a different kind of model in which you can get, in principle, slightly bigger shifts. So the internal consistency of the data sets constrains us, so we are also not able to get more than two sigma shifts. But the numbers sort of work out for, ver for pretty modest um, enhancements of G, we get, you know, a halfway resolution of the H naught tension. This one? This is saying that uh, screening is, is uh, determined quite locally. So, uh, so, a so, you know, if you compare it to the others, in the others, a galaxy can be screened by a, a, a big cluster that's five megaparsecs away, which is what you expect in FFR type models. This one says that a galaxy won't be screened unless something else is, you know, within half a megaparsec, a big neighbor. So these are the details of screening models. So it just shows you that you could have a model in which you can almost do it. So there are many caveats, of course, to our work, as to any of the others. In my personal opinion, our resolution is no uglier than some of the, than most of the others. Uh, but there is one observation that would probably kill our resolution, which is if the strong lensing estimate, um, which does not rely on Cepheids, shows the same result, we're out of business. Uh, let me just skip over this and um, just note that the business of coming up with theoretical resolutions of the H0 tension is wide open. So I'll conclude by looking ahead to the Euclid LSST era, which is a few years away now. So we indeed live in very exciting times. The Dark Energy Survey and other surveys are still you know, <clears throat> uh, rushing to get our results out as these uh, much bigger surveys are starting. So how will they help? Bigger sky coverage means you get more cosmological modes. Greater redshift depth means you can go to higher redshift and also get more modes. They have been, d surprisingly, at least for weak lensing, these are arguably the first missions, LSST and Euclid, that have been designed to do weak lensing. You know, we are carrying out the dark energy survey using a telescope that's older than I am. That was, you know, designed for general purpose astronomy, so we have a new camera. But uh, there was, you know, the controlling uh, the telescope optics and so on to the level that is needed for weak lensing is something that has only been implemented very carefully for LSST and Euclid. So <clears throat> we certainly, and of course, a lot of other improvements mean systematics should be much better controlled. Uh, and hopefully, we have enough uh, theoretically minded people uh, who will develop the codes and techniques necessary to go beyond two point correlations. You know, many of us have been thinking about higher order statistics and other non-Gaussian measures for a long time. Now there are papers that come and say that, you know, don't worry about calculating statistics at all. I have this deep learning technique that lets you compare your survey to a thousand simulations and we can get um, constraints on dark energy parameters and sigma eight that are twice as good as, as what you're doing with power spectra. So there's a lot of interesting theory of course, people worry about using machine learning in which you can't, uh, you know, look inside the black box to understand how it's working. But a factor of two is, is not something we should ignore. So there's a huge amount of, uh, of effort in going beyond two-point correlations. 
I'm also interested in various small scale phenomena that are you know, not described using the language of two point correlations almost at all. For example, uh, we, we have a, uh, a, you know, a small ho consistent hobby called uh, splashback in galaxy clusters where we look at features in the outer profile of galaxy clusters that correspond to a dynamical boundary that's sensitive to dark matter interactions, for example. It tells you with particles falling in a cluster if the dark matter is truly cold and non-interacting or if it's had interactions, it would fall in a little closer and we can see that feature, we hope. So we've got really nice detections in both galaxies and lensing with DES and that's an ongoing project that I would love to tell you about another time. So I should wrap up in a few minutes. So just to put some numbers, we're hoping to get a factor of two to three improvement with the completed uh, DES and Euclid and LSST will independently gain, very roughly speaking, an additional factor of at least four. That's not counting novel developments in statistics and stuff. In parallel, the CMB surveys are advancing. I haven't listed the acronyms, but many of you know that the ACT and SPD collaborations are still working on getting you know, much higher resolution and sensitive measurements than Planck, although on a much smaller part of the sky. And the Simons Observatory, which uh, you know, Penn is one of the institutions on, is going to start taking data on about the same time scale as Euclid. So that's a wonderful opportunity for galaxy CMB cross correlations. And uh, you know, that increases statistical power. It increases our reach in redshift tremendously. Um, <clears throat> so we should get not just better constraints, but also if you think about dark energy, not as some very simple W not WA model, but you give it more freedom to have some interesting behavior in redshift that you would miss if you use some simple two parameter model, then you can think about principal components of these general dark energy behaviors or the behavior of gravity. So we should be getting at least two additional parameters that we can constrain at a non-trivial level. And of course, there's a neutrino mass that is waiting to be detected and that error will definitely provide a detection unless uh, the, the, uh, the real neutrinos are not what theorists expect them to be. And, uh, you know, with the non-detection of WIMPs, the field of what dark matter is, is wide open. So various signatures of dark matter could show up inside halos or on the larger scales. So there's the puzzles, sigma-8, H0, A lens and others, and the possibility of this other new physics that, um, that awaits us in the next decade. So that's my last slide. Uh, many of you know uh, or have seen these sorts of things, but the different, this figure is from Andrina Nicola at Princeton. Uh, the different colors show, you know, redshift surveys, 21 centimeter that I haven't talked about, CMB, and, uh, oh sorry, and 21 centimeter again, and uh, lensing surveys, Euclid, LSST, and a little further down, W first. Uh, so the combination of these data sets is of course gonna be amazing in ways that we have not even foreseen. Thank you very much. I'm pretty sure there'll be plenty of questions. Dimitri. Wait a minute. Dimitri. So if, so if you uh, change uh, the gravity for, so if you change the gravity for uh, Cepheids in different galaxies, what about other stars? And uh, so that, uh, still a physics. So that's part of the fine tuning that we have only a factor of 10 to play with in the variation and the potential. And so we choose the threshold so that the screening happens for main sequence stars while giant stars are partially unscreened. So, so it works by radius or by mass? 
it, uh, some of the details depend on the model, but typically by the surface potential. Yeah. So that's the only fine tuning. Thank you. Given the present state uh, of well established observations, a few shown and wider, uh, the minimal um, uh, solution, say, or proposal, the most economic, without touching the fundamental laws of physics we know very well, theoretically and observational, could be to um, complete um, the um, dark energy understanding, which we don't know <laughs> very well, um, by saying that it's most important in the early universe than expected. After all, from inflation, we know that there is a dark energy, which is the vacuum energy which drives inflation. And then after, it could not be completely died. Right. Perhaps the evolution is what uh, should be understood, and that, uh, and that is in the, in the way of, uh, lambda, uh, of the lambda standard, whatever we could call. This is my observation. Uh, yes, so the proposals I referred to are somewhat similar to what you said. So uh, if there's inflation, then there was a period of uh, you know, vacuum energy domination then. And there was reheating. Dark e in the proposals that I described, dark energy then becomes negligible. And then there's a brief period uh, where dark energy makes a second appearance. But that period is restricted on, on either side to be consistent with CMB observations. So that's why it's, so you know, people have written down potentials that can accomplish that, but obviously it's quite contrived. The, the comment there is barely going through the Planck error bars, and we know that it's the next generation that is already uh, financed. This type of explanation is definitely testable. Yep. Yes. And yes. Be, they are just debating planet and completely in the grasp of the next generation. So this one at least will know uh, relatively soon. I agree. I agree. So then it's there, we'll know. Planck already constrains them so they can only resolve yeah, halfway. But even that Right, I agree. In these alternative theories, um, the screening mechanism is set so that you agree with solar system experiments and binary pulsar measurements in the Milky Way. Now, if you could measure, say, the parameter gamma better by a factor of 10, say with Pepe Colombo, would that you have back to impede your ability to use these models with Cepheids? So the post-Newtonian parameter gamma is Generally speaking, the screening is, uh, is very sharp. So, so once you cross the screening threshold, it's not difficult to satisfy a 10 times more stringent measurement. But even so, you know, it depends on the model and the details of the screening. So improved measurements are, are definitely interesting, especially if they show a breakdown <laughs> of GR. Uh, what's the status of the tension on AL and in particular in connection with the sigma tension? I'm not an expert on A lens. I hear different views, so <laughs> let's open the field if somebody would like to comment. My general view is that the sigma A tension is more robust and the A lens tension may evolve, but Yeah, so a lens is, is really compatible with, uh, with scatter. It changes with the fraction of sky. It's in all the, uh, all the frequencies we've measured the uh, temperature. It's in the temperature and not in polarization. Well, error bars on polarization are not enough that you can say much about it, but clearly it's really, it really looks like a, 
like, like scatter. And God, we spent so much time trying to find a, a systematic based explanation for that. So, I mean, we, we could be wrong. I mean, I would be delighted to see people uh, showing us wrong. But clearly, that looks like scatter. I mean, people have been, have been trying to pinpoint attention to a particular bin or something. Uh, that we, we know why some bins are scattering. There are some of those that have just statistical uh, scatter, and that's it. We, we live in a slightly weird uni universe. That's fine. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to ask your opinion on the fact that you quote tensions on derived parameters which are projected out from from a much higher dimensional space. And um, if you actually consider where the like the bulk posterior is the, in high, in higher dimensions, the the you know the posterior is is very not Gaussian. Uh, and so if you constrict parts of of that space to where the samples are relevant, then you can actually completely get rid of tensions, even just by considering like constricted spaces of of the likelihood, um, so I, I didn't follow your last point. Okay, well, uh, what, just what that mean? that because you can have say say in two dimensions you could have a banana shape, and if you marginalize out one of those things to to your derived parameter, then even though the bulk of the posterior could be here, then then you can actually if you used important sampling, you can look at a different part, and that removes the tension. So, so needless to say, people have studied this quite carefully and have quantified the tension in this full high-dimensional yeah. parameter space. So the tensions that I was casually describing as two sigma through marginalized uh, posteriors are two sigma in the full parameter space as well. But you're absolutely right that it is very uh, tricky business. But, but if you have a personal analysis that yeah, that you want to tell us more about, I'm interested. We'll we'll okay. Sounds good. We have two questions here. So you mentioned some possible tests of uh, new gravity in the solar system. What do you think about, because this solar system is well known now, so what, more precisely, what do you think about? What do I think about? Uh, yes, new tests? Test, as possible tests. You mean for the future? No, my so my question is, so what tests do you, do you, do you think about? about uh, you know, f to, to yeah. test these theories, right. Okay, that's a, that's a very good point. So I said that you can come up with some scalar tensor theory that alleviates H naught. Well, how can we test it? And we do some of the tests in our paper itself which constrain the allowed space of deviations. And the tests involve using different gravitational traces, like Cepheids, like TRGBs. Um, and so that's one type of test. I mean, it's a long topic. I'm trying to <laughs> uh, simplify my thoughts. But uh, for example, another test is the comparison of lensing and dynamical masses of galaxies and clusters that can show hints of a breakdown. The, it's like a multi-scale problem. There are lab tests, there are solar system tests, and there are galaxy and larger scale tests. And depending on the particular model you're considering, one or more of them can be more effective. But I don't have time to, to give you a, a more detailed answer. So there's lunar laser ranging. That's one of the tests of uh, you know, these laser beams that are shined back and forth to the moon. And, th and they constrain. Um, th they provide one of the, the strongest constraints. And uh, the test rate, you know, there's the rings of Saturn provide another test. But 
the, the torsion pendulum provides another test. Uh, just a short comment about uh, the observations, future observations. Uh, I think that the most uh, direct way that if uh, uh, the, there is this problem for, uh, I mean, tension between H dot early time and late time is the uh, measurement, direct measurement of H dot at higher redshifts, for instance, at uh, uh, redshift around uh, 2.5 with uh, measurement of uh, uh, line around four line and, uh, and maybe at uh, aerial time around the time of uh, uh, recombination with 21 centimeter. I don't know if there is any project for doing this sort of direct measurements of, uh, and also something that which I, I was want to, uh, I just mentioned here, the, uh, you didn't mention the measurement from gravitational waves, which would be progressing uh, gradually in the next few years. Yes, so uh, if we can find, if LIGO finds more gravity wave events with, you know, black hole neutron star mergers with optical counterparts where you can find the galaxy, then, you know, once, you're, once you cross a dozen such events, you can, you can start to get competitive H0. Uh, the prospects at this moment don't look amazing on the few year time scale because LIGO has been operating with much higher sensitivity for a few months and there hasn't been another event. Two events, uh, but they were not observed completely. Uh, two events which are probably the first uh, black hole, but uh, they are not uh, information Yeah, maybe, but, uh, but that's the reality, that, that we just have one event so far. So yeah, it, it's a very appealing method. It's very new. Uh, I personally don't think it's going to give us a competitive H naught in the next few years, but it's definitely very worth pursuing because it's direct, just like strong lensing, it's independent of these things, and it's probably cleaner than strong lensing. The other things you mentioned about higher redshift, you know, I didn't have time to talk about the BAO constraints on H naught, but uh, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that that's what's called the inverse distance ladder. So you, they're calibrated using the CMB or, um, or BBN. Um, and so they belong in the early universe side of H0. But clearly those are very important as well. Any other questions? So I think we should, uh, oh, one last. Oh yeah. So when we actually measure like parameters like omega matter, we know that the local measurement uh, gives a different value from the Planck measurements. It's much lower, you know, it's like 0 0.25 or something. And this has been going on for many years. So how much of that tension, like four, five, or six sigma, is actually quite boring, you know, in, due to the fact that local universe is just different from the global universe? <laughs> okay, you said two things. The first, I think I understand that uh, what I was referring to as a sigma eight tension, you know, at the next level of nuance, it's, uh, you know, once you look at contours in sigma eight omega matter plane, which I showed, and you see it, there's also a tension in omega matter. Uh, but then you said something about it's not a big deal. Uh, that's a pretty big deal. <laughs> <laughs> if, I mean, how much of, how, what part of that is not a big deal? You know, it's a 4.5 sigma, so. The, the H naught tension is yeah, 4.5 sigma. Yeah. The omega matter tension is two-ish sigma. Okay, so how much of that 4.5 or six sigma that is on H naught is just sort of, you know, you would just have to consider that the, the local measurements of this H naught can be different from the global one. Oh, are you referring to the local void possibility? Well, local void or other measurements, you know, like when we measure omega matter, it's very different, or we measure the bulk flow, it's different, you know, than the global one taken from the power spectrum. So how much of, how many of uh, those sigmas can go away if you uh, Okay, um, uh, yeah, I, so the omega, when I, what I mean by the omega matter uh, tension is completely, more or less completely independent of the H naught tension. Yeah, I know that. If you want to connect them, then you need a local void. 
where the you know the local h uh, the 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 h naught inside a few, a few hundred megaparsecs is different from the true h naught in the universe today, and that proposal doesn't work because the supernova sample uh, completely sample a range of distance. Not, not connecting them, but just that you know, like h like omega matter, if you also measure h naught locally, it doesn't have to be the same as the one that is measured from CMB because local universe has peculiarities that can account for I don't know. Zygmunt. Like what peculiarities? Well, like you know, that we are living in a low density universe, we are living in a, in a part of the universe that has got a bigger, bigger than expected uh, 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 velocity, mean velocity, things like that, you know. I mean, it would be, you don't have to be an average place, right? Uh, we don't have to be, but all the measurements show that we are not a big sigma fluctuation. What so. Uh, just the supernova data constrain the local void possibility quite tightly. That's, that's just one model. I mean. Yeah, uh, definitely, it's it's possible that somebody will come up with a more interesting model. I think all the studies that have been done so far conclude that you, you could reduce this by not quite the same. Yeah. I mean, there you, you can. I mean, well, yes, there is an density. The question is, can we resolve the tension? Everybody that has been looking at it, there are the three, four, or five papers. They are all converged to sort of say that's not enough. Yep. Uh, by itself, of course, you could have several vague like right. I mean, right. which is a possibility. But that's not the, the one that sold the whole. Right. We, we right. Agree. Yeah, no. I, uh, yeah. I think you both have a point. O Occam's razor is only a useful guide, it may not be reality. Maybe there's a few one, two sigma effects at, at work. Okay, well, I think we should know Sanks Bhuvnesh.